Okay. Okay, everyone. Um, let's get started with the next session. Still waiting on a couple of people, but I think it's a good idea to get started anyway. So what we're going to do, we're just changing the session up a little bit. Um, still the same topic for disease surveillance, um, but just to give the countries a little more time, um, if we're able to talk about the surveillance toolkit, uh, we will do so at the end, but I'm going to allow the countries to go first, just so they can, you know, not have to rush through their presentations and there's time for questions and everything like that. If there is time at the end, of course, um, we can talk about the toolkit. I've uploaded that presentation um, and you can have a look at it as well. So I'm going to invite our colleague from Lebanon to come speak in, uh, right now. And then we're also going to hear from um, Pakistan as well as Lao um, in this session as well. So please, sir. Yes, thank you, everybody. I'm uh, Hussam Shamma from the Real Tour Lebanon. Uh, thank you for allowing me to participate in this presentation. Uh, I'm going to present the uh, HIS2 implementation in Lebanon. Uh, by the way, I have prepared this presentation in coordination with the Ministry of Health with the surveillance uh, unit team. Uh, we are working as a close cooperation with the Ministry of Health on these projects. I'll just give you a briefing about uh, Lebanon. Next, thank you. Okay, about, uh, let's talk about a little bit about Lebanon. We are in the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, we are the smallest uh, country compared to your, your area. We just 10,000 kilometers squared. And we have 4 million population. And we have the big challenge that we have uh, 2 million refugees in, uh, and we have 4 million population. So half of the people here there are refugees coming from Syria and Palestinian. And just us uh, giving us a big challenge to keep the health system working uh, well. So we started in 2014 and uh, in close cooperation with the Minister of Health, uh, we're supporting them financially and technically. Uh, since then we're focusing on the disease more mostly. We are using the HIS for disease monitoring. We have many system uh, in Lebanon but especially the diseases is controlled by the HIS since 2014. So we started with the aggregate data in 2014. Then later we moved to tracker bases and uh, with the support of HIST India, we're just trying to uh, activate our GIS module in the HIS because we have many layers already on, as we were using usually as we platform. And now we are moving the GIS platform to the HIS. So, uh, getting us our Kaza, our Mohafaza, our peripherals. So we are importing them on the HIS with the support of uh, HESP India. Uh, we migrated many times on the server since 2014, but in the meantime, we are now on 2.345. Okay, we have three servers. We prefer to distribute the load. So we got uh, three servers running at the same time, the same version. And from to time to time, we just upgrade them uh, with the support of HESP India. And uh, we made some custom uh, reporting on the on DHIS, the uh, different from the standard one. So we have our own reporting system at the same time. Yes, please. Okay, just I will brief you about uh, what we had to uh, implement. I will not go through them, all of them, but I have selected some of them. Maybe we can go in details. But mostly this is our uh, forms that we have used. We have some data sets, we have for the hospital weekly and for the medical center reporting, we have for laboratory, we have active uh, visit surveillance, we have school based, we have for the COVID, we have for cholera lately, we get some cholera cases and we have staff performing reporting. Uh, concerning, uh, I will, I'm selecting some of, the, some of them later on, we'll go through. And concerning tracking, for the trackers, we have the influenza, we have uh, disease reporting, we have cholera, we have samples, we have COVID, uh, we have ICU reporting, we have water testing, babies, and others uh, uh, to. Next, please. Okay. <laughs> Funny. Uh, so I'm going to talk about uh, COVID. We made some uh, Tracker based case, but uh, this is not just normal COVID one. It was uh, a project by WHO to analyze the, the COVID patient from A to Z when he admitted to the hospital until he left the hospital. 
So based on the actual recommendation, we get uh, some forms concerning COVID. So we have the full patient file from day one till he's either dead or he's, uh, he's out from the hospitals, the full parameters. So it was a uh, case-based uh, reporting. We made it at Hariri Hospital, it's a governmental hospital, where uh, we analyzed the form, we developed the form, and we implemented it in 2021, okay? And we captured around 200 patients, full file. And later on, this data has been sent to our medical committee in Lebanon to analyze uh, the stages that the COVID patient uh, is passing. So to know exactly how to enhance the treatment and what medication should be given for them. So it was uh, really helpful for us to, to manage the COVID patient. So it was full, full file patient file. Uh, next please. Another project was for national TB. Uh, for the TB, uh, we did not use the TB already existing one in DHIS, but based on the uh, WHO form, we develop our own TB programs. And uh, based on national TB program uh, by the Ministry of Health requests, uh, accordingly, we have developed for them the form of tracker base. And uh, has some workflow where the patient uh, first captured by the by X-ray on the hospital, then it can be sent later on to for, uh, for treatment for sanatorium for the to be has a treatment for if it is a case it's confirmed case because we have two different systems one one was not confirmed case only this guy we are capturing him on only the confirmed case the latent patient is not captured in the system so it's composed of nine stages as you can see these are just put it down. The, the NTP lab, the NOL, the baseline test, the diagnosis, drug susceptible, drug resistant, adverse event latent, contacts. All these stages, the patient will pass it through. Okay. But uh, each type of user has access on them. Let's see, the nurse can access some stages, the lab can access another stages, the sanatorium will access another stages. So this is not open for everybody. And uh, we are trying to see how we can transfer one patient from one center to another center. I'm just discussing with this now. So how to enhance the transfer of patient. So when he leaves the sanatorium, then he has to go to TB center. So we have to transfer the file. So this is a challenge for us, how to manage the workflow in, uh, in DHIS. So as we can see, we started lately this program. And right now we're working on the uh, dashboard uh, to analyze the data has been collected. Next, please. Okay, concerning COVID, the uh, HIS2 was not used as a, as a system for uh, giving certificate. We have another system uh, adopted by the government called IMPACT, it was manipulating all the COVID uh, cases in Lebanon where people can register and take the vaccination. So the impact system was for vaccination and while DHS was for tracing the COVID cases, confirmed cases. So the survey issued by the Ministry of Health, they developed this form uh, capturing all COVID cases. So it covering the patient identification, the case investigation, the fatal outcome, and even it was capturing the contact cases. And by the way, we reached at uh, that time about uh, 1 million records. Knowing that we are uh, 4 million plus 2 million refugees, we have 6 million people. And we got around uh, 1 million cases, confirmed cases. It started January 2020. And uh, even it was used by municipalities because when they have a contact cases and uh, confirmed cases, the municipality was tracing the citizen to be sure that staying home and uh, who's contacting them. Uh, Who's uh, the, who have seen? So the municipality uh, played a big role to, to monitor the confirmed cases and the contact cases. So we give the access for municipalities and we, we train them on the uh, HIS2 and they have a username, password to, to monitor their area. So each municipality is controlling their own uh, territory. Next, please. And for this uh, tracker case, we get a Hazri organization unit. We capture the cases. We give some credential for the municipality, for, for the labs. Because the labs were entering that uh, the result of COVID directly was not coming to the ministry by paper. It was online. 
So we give users for the certified uh, laboratory for COVID. They have a username and password. They were entering directly the, the result of the, of the test. And we made some uh, dashboards and we get some import from Excel for the big hospital where they have the lab, their own laboratory, they refuse to use DHIS. Accordingly, we made sort of Excel importing system. So we are importing some data on Excel to DHIS. And then at the end, we analyze some, uh, some data using the SQL and R and QGIS. Next, please. Lately, this is the first time Lebanon gets some cholera cases uh, due to, to refugees and uh, other, sometimes we're getting a new disease in Lebanon. So sometimes we're getting some cholera cases coming from Syria. So if we found out that we have to capture this uh, cholera cases, and we decided to develop a DHS tracker for, for cholera cases. So again, it's uh, developed by the, the surveillance unit at Ministry of Health. So the same case, uh, approximately the same routine as uh, COVID, and we have trained uh, the hospital labs to, to feed up the data. As you can notice, not of us are entering the data. Each time we have a case, we are trying to let the user enter the data, give them a user access and we train them. And uh, only Munich of Health role is to monitor the data and to validate them. Okay, so mostly we prefer to be done directly in the lab, not by Munich of Health to reduce the error. And as you can see, the stages uh, that's been defined for this column. Stage one, two, three, four. Next, please. Okay, concerning the organization unit. Okay, we have five levels of the country, eight provinces, 26 districts, and we have uh, 1,015 uh, localities and five, around 6,000 facilities. And the facilities are composed of labs, uh, hospital, medical center, elderly houses, and schools. By the way, the school are involved in uh, the system. And they took a lot of effort for us to involve them in the system, but uh, they are committed and they are, we can, usually we monitor cases if a student happens some special case with them, they fit up in the DHS, uh, the patient, the student case. And as you can see the chart, uh, the distribution of uh, users that uh, we have around 8,000 users using the system. So as you can see the data, so when you still doesn't enter any data, we don't have any forms coming, everything electronic, facility directly enter the data, or we can have an Excel import into the system. It's feed up in the DHIS. Later on, the role of Minister of Health to investigate, to update the data, to clean the data, and to analyze it. At the end, we developing some reports and dashboard and sharing with other decision makers. So as you can see, this is the workflow of the data and the, the, who is doing the validation, and the role of each part of this process. Thanks, please. These are some of the reports. We have about 113 dashboards for all uh, tracker and uh, the aggregate data. Okay, and then we have some visualizer. Next, please. Okay. And we have about 900 uh, surveillance reports starting 2020. And we share the data with the Facebook, WhatsApp, Twitter, by Minister of Health, these data are being posted. And this is the site of Minister of Health. So everything has been published from the HAS directly to the public sites. Next, please. This more reporting in Arabic, as you can see. And this is Lebanon and the Muhammad al -Khabra. Okay, this is about the cholera, the distribution of the cases. Around, around now, we have around 600 cases of cholera in Lebanon. Next, please. Concerning support, we have a trained Minister of Health to, to perform the report and uh, creating the tracker and the aggregate data. At the same time, we as WHO, we provide them with the financial concerning the hardware, the servers, the setup, and the uh, server support. 
and sometimes we develop we help them developing some forms and uh, assisting them in some uh, some things happening. And also the other support is uh, has been there concerning the upgrade and data migration and concerning the GIS layers, they help us to update our server. So mostly we have three level uh, of support on the HIS. Future plans. Okay. As I said, we have three servers. About uh, two years ago, we upgraded to 2.35.4. And then now we are planning in March to upgrade to the latest version 2.39 to get some advantages of workflow and other app, existing app. Uh, we have tested the mobile app. So as you know, in Lebanon, uh, usually we have a lot of uh, iOS uh, mobile, not only Android. This is a challenge for us as uh, the HS is only using Android. I don't know how we're going to solve it. We tested some form on the our mobile phone, but still we did not go deeply in this technology. We are planning in 2023 to go a little more on, uh, on mobile, use a mobile app and see uh, how the user will be, uh, the reaction. It would be interesting for us while doing some survey to have this DHIS on the floor. But at the same time, still uh, the input and the export, we find it a little bit uh, not easy to perform. So we'll try to migrate to APIs and uh, enhance the input and export uh, facilities for our system. So to have more open system for other system to talk to the HIS or the HIS server. So we're going to invest more in the input export uh, features. Next, please. The main challenge is we have a financial crisis since uh, two years now. Our banks has uh, big issues and this uh, financial crisis is affecting uh, the whole countries in many areas. Most of all, uh, the electricity is uh, mostly down and uh, when the electricity is down, the internet is down. So uh, working without internet is uh, very difficult for us these days and the data collection is not stable anymore. And concerning the infrastructures, okay, WHO is helping building the, the main center, but what about the peripherals? Who will invest in uh, performing the, because the peripherals, they don't have any more budget to cover their infrastructure and uh, update their setup. So again, the infrastructures of the whole country, since two years, we have problems upgrading uh, and the, the Ministry of Health doesn't have any more budget to do some upgrades. So we are stuck with some uh, old existing hardware. And uh, for the staff, uh, due to the crisis, many qualified staff are leaving Lebanon for other countries. So when you invest in training for the staff, then later on you, you lose the staff. Again, you start from zero again to training other staff. So the stability of the staff is affecting the stability of the of capturing the data on the floor. Uh, especially this financial crisis affecting the remote area. Uh, because mostly uh, the infrastructure is very really bad and uh, the environment they're living in is very hard. So to getting remote data is getting being harder now after the crisis. In addition, as I told you, we're getting a new viruses in Lebanon. So it's new for us. And uh, each time we, we recover from a virus, we get another virus. Now we are in cholera. And maybe we're starting now with the monkeypox. Again, we get some figures now showing up on monkeypox. So we are keep up creating new tracker cases for us from one disease to another diseases. We finish from one, from one case to moving to another case. And the Ministry of Health has some limitation in those stuff, especially after the crisis. So we are uh, running out of time capturing uh, the data due to the crisis itself. Next, please. Should be the last part, yes. This is thank you in all languages, I think. So everybody <laughs> should be here. Thank you. If any question, I'm ready to answer. I'll give her a microphone.
Hi, yes. Um, thanks so much for sharing kind of about PPHS to the presentation in Lebanon. Um, I have a question on um, so on one of the slides you mentioned is about forbidden to use PPIS. And I just wanted to ask like how how is that, how do you go about that in practice? Is that through some kind of plugin in PPIS, some kind of custom um like API usage or, or, or something else? Uh, now, just uh, as I told you, we are just investing in GIS and in, uh, in DHIS, uh, GIS uh, module. As the first level, we are just capturing the Mohafaza and Qadas. Now we reach the level of localities. And, but uh, but uh, since we have an advanced SV modules and advanced servers, we're just exporting them as an Excel. So based on OUs, we have a matching same OUs. So we match them and we, we project them on the maps. So and at the meantime, we just take them as an Excel format. Okay, thank you. Welcome. Okay, uh, I want to ask that uh, you make a mobile app to the HIS using iOS. So, how can you make it? Do uh, you make it with another app that uh, on iOS and then you make it work or something like that? Till now, the HS people did not help me to solve this is iOS, still pending, and they don't want to invest in iOS. I don't know, but uh, we are facing, especially with the high management, usually they have iOS system. And uh, till now, we can't find a solution to it. So to buy them another phone, Android, it's difficult for us. And it's not practical. So till now, uh, just iOS giving to the users, but for top management and Ministry of Health, we don't have this facility. We, we cannot uh, have them on mobile till now. Thank you. Any other questions? Great. Thank you for your presentation. Thank you. So I'm going to ask the team from Lao to come up next. Okay, thank you. Um, after two days that we have um, meeting and uh, many countries that have presented and today, uh, I'm from Laos, my, my name is Suban and I'm, I, I, I work for PSI Laos and today on behalf of Lao team, uh, we have a chance and I'm very happy to be here and present about the civil lunch in Laos. Uh, since we have the um, DHI2 system come to Lao and we have implemented so so many years already. Uh, next slide. Yes, and today I would uh, I would like to present about the system outline, uh, breakout and the transition between the own system. Uh, from the old system to the new system, DHSI2. And the, the first one is the system design configuration and deployment process. And the next is uh, the data entry where, where we are capturing the data entry in the DHSI2. And then uh, where is the data source that we be we, we picking up from that to enter into the DHSI2. And then the next outline is a training and deployment. And for data to action, these are I'll be talking about the data that we have entered into the ESI2 and then for further use in the like for for the in investigation and for for the response for the uh, any outbreaks in Laos. 
And the last one is the next step. Yeah. So next slide, please. Okay, this are uh, before before the DHI two will uh, implemented in Lao PDR, uh, especially for the um, civil art department. Uh, we already have uh, discussed about uh, like um, many things to to enable the government to like um uh, to monitor in in terms of the uh, infection disease surveillance in Laos. Uh, in during uh, 2020 uh, to 2021, the Ministry of Health have developed the um, notifiable disease in the DSI through uh, to, to deploy to the, um, and to replacement of the own programs we call our Iwan. But Iwan is a, the database that have developed it in the Microsoft Access. Uh, Maybe you, uh, maybe most of the country here maybe use the uh, access database to to create database or for some disease or yeah, something. But now, uh, before we using the uh, DSI two, we have developed the uh, database. It is uh, called Excel, uh, uh, Excel, Microsoft Access to to capture the data that this is runs for further detection and for the the data to uh, investigation and response. Yeah, uh, next slide, please. Okay, for, for this slide, I'm talking about the transition between the uh, the own program, the law you want, we call law you want, uh, to the uh, to the DHSI2, which is a, uh, uh, once again, uh, civil and in law, especially for the department, uh, we call in the so national uh, National Center for Laboratory and Epidemiologies is uh, the new department that it allow. We are starting using the DHSI too. So it's, uh, it, it's uh, quite new for the uh, people or for, for the health worker to uh, implement it in the DHSI too. And uh, since 2003 uh, to 2018, uh, can you? Again. Okay, no. Ah, uh, yeah, stop there. No. And um, in twenty three to twenty eighteen, uh, we we have developed the um the Excel database is called access uh, database access to correct the the, the surveillance in Lao. and uh, for for a data analysis and uh, for further detection and response for the uh, any outbreak uh, we have many implementation uh, we have many conducted in during that year we have uh, been using that uh, Microsoft Excel that um, we have uh, the partner from from the uh, abroad to develop this database for the surveillance in Laos. And we have using this uh, for a couple, year, a couple of years. And since that time, we, we, because it's, uh, this Lao Yuan is an apply program. So uh, this program is just applied to the, um, only the PSO level to do data entry. So it's, uh, I, I mean that these are very limited databases. Yeah in this time and 20 in 2018 to 20 so, uh, 21 a dhi2 have occurring in that time in late 20 um 2018 the we have pilot in uh, the capital for the um pilot in data entry for the for the uh, dhi2 and parallel with the the, the law you want because we cannot like uh, throw out uh, the own program, which is like while we are using the new program, so the own program we we are still using. So it means that uh, since that time we are using the two 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 system at the same time. So it's very really hard uh, for people to working on. But we have to uh, to do like that because we we cannot uh, uh, throw away one program, which is uh, they are already using at the at first yeah. and then um 
And then we have implemented and we have um, imported the data because uh, we have the historical data from the own program. Because in the DSI 2 we just uh, allow, it's well allowed. We just start in, started in 2018. And for the own, for the own uh, data from the uh, Excel spreadsheet, we have, uh, we have to store that data into the DSI 2 right and we have a lot of data to clean to import and then uh, for this process we have the uh it's been numb to help on that and we we took a long time to to clean the data from the excel to the dsi2 and the the importation is a complex uh it's more than like uh for for more than uh two or three years so we yeah, and then together with that, following that, we have the uh, TOT training. We call the HSI tool uh, just started, and we have to like uh, uh, to make a plan to develop develop plan for in terms of the using. And at first, uh, we have a data to store, and uh, the next step we have to train for the uh, provincial level staff, or I mean for the health worker staff to do the time free. And as well, it's a uh, really hard to to conduct. But uh, but in the end, so many of level can do it, and we have so many training uh, at at that time and PSO training, DSO training as well. Yeah, it, that that is occurring in in uh, twenty eighteen to twenty one, and later in twenty twenty two this year this year. Uh, because we in Sabalan Ila, we started to using the uh, DSI two as a, like an in, informal system, and then uh, since that time in twenty uh, up, up, up to now in April twenty twenty two, uh, the government they have like uh, in, announced as a formal uh, letter to to uh, to stop using the the own system uh, for call out you want to include integrated into fully into the DSI 2 in April 22. And it means that um, all of the country we are, are stopping one, the own program initiated uh, using new, new, new system is called DSI 2. Yeah. And also uh, currently yeah, in this year, uh, in Sivalan Ila, we are conducting the DQA data quality assessment because we just uh, started since we have, uh, we implemented the HSI2 for the We uh, We just, right now we just go into the phase of the DQA. But this uh, phase DQA we have, uh, we don't have exactly the, like a, uh, the report or the tool to detection the DQA yet, but we are working on that with the uh, partner. Yes, uh, next slide please. Yeah, uh, this is the um, system design and configuration. Uh, before that, I'm talking about the key components uh, before we uh, start using the new system. Uh, the key, the key component is our yeah, the information system, the uh, specific uh, and, and the design and the training and the technical design. So uh, for this one, the te technical design is um, because uh, as first we don't have like too many personnel to support, and we just like uh, in terms of the um the capacity of the, the user as well. So we have to find out there like um uh, the personnel to help on that to below everything. So it's hard as start as well. And then uh, I'm talking about the um the data flow. Yeah, and for this one. For the data flow, or maybe for the uh, workflow, as you uh, obviously the the picture one and the picture two. These are the picture one is the the own program like call out you want. The data flow is uh, the data was captured by the PSO, the provincial level, and for the low, uh, lower level, they just send the the uh, the data to the PSO, and then PSO they will enter the data in, into the, uh, the log one program. And then for further for the center, they will extract the data to the uh, central level. 
to enter the data again for further produce for the data and analyze for the uh, to look at the outbreak and investigation. So this is the data for, for the, uh, the own program, but it's uh, slightly different from the from the uh, uh, picture two. Picture two is the um, the HI2 surveillance that um, this data has applied to many levels. I mean, for the DHI2, uh, the data capture is uh, captured by the health facility worker. So it means that uh, before we using the DHI2, we have reduced uh, capacity of the, um, we have reduced work for the uh, PSO staff or central staff. Because the DHI2, we can apply to the all level, right? So, uh, the health facility person, they will enter the data indirectly into the DHI2. It's compared to the own program. Uh, PSO will do data entry by themselves, and then we have to, to uh, do the data quality and many things so on. Yes, and very slightly di different. And for the um, uh, DHI2 at the moment, uh, PSO, they have more time in, in terms of the DQA, and even though they, the civil and epidemiology staff, they have more time to do the uh, DQA before they, uh, before they uh, produce the data for uh, investigation and disease response. So, uh, this slide. <laughs> it's coming. Okay, just please be patient. Yeah. <laughs> uh, these are yeah, techno is, uh, technical issues. Okay, this uh, like uh, this slide we will talk about the data entry and sort document. Yeah, uh, the data entry in surveillance in Laos, especially for the epidemiology uh, department, we use eye capture to to capture the data because I think it's uh, different from the many countries here. You are using the uh, the aggregate data entry, which is a uh, pretty easy right to use. But allow allow the surveillance uh, for especially for the uh, the disease surveillance uh, we call eighteen notable notifiable disease. We use eye capture, which is uh, even even capturing. So many detail in the uh, paper form we have entered into the uh, eye capture app, which is like an effort is really really hard for the user to enter the data as you as you know. Uh, and there's a uh, many condition that's why we have like been uh uh hard in, in terms of using the DS, dsi2 one thing is uh because there's a limited like a uh, scale of the user as well yeah and as you can see we uh surveillance allow we are uh, capturing the data by the event and then we also have the silo reporting uh, we have case and silo reporting because uh, why is that uh, the silo reporting is very important for uh, epidemiology as well because we uh, they, we would like to know the cases that that's happened in the dairy, right? So if we don't know, so how can we uh, detect uh, the outbreak and investigation of hope for the disease outbreak? So uh, the silo reporting the is uh, important as well. So every day the uh, health worker they will report. No, no matter that they don't have any cases, so they have to report to the DHI2. And then we will look at the dashboard to see the data. If there's, uh, if someday that they have the, the case to report, so it's, uh, it's outbreak. So it depend, depends on the disease, right? If a uh, vaccinable disease, so just one case is will be alert. So yeah, something like that. And uh, here, in the, in the right top of the uh, screen, you will see the list of the, um, the surveillance disease in Laos. Yeah, we have also we have 18, 18 uh, diseases. That's, that's the government, especially for the uh, NCOE, they are, they are um, monitoring and they have to follow up every day for 18. Uh, one is uh, AP. Uh, AP and the second one is people LS. Uh, it's a very common co common disease that has occurred in Laos. And also the next one is uh, dengue. Yeah, uh, dengue is very very popular at the moment. Yeah, and also we have good system. I mean the DHI two. If compared to the uh, own program, what you want, the uh, the data just uh, seeing uh, watching it by the uh, central level. So. Yeah, then we switch off 
perform their own program to the DSI-2. When the disease have been entering into the DSI-2, all of the health workers, they know they're aware of that. So then they know like uh, what is the, the, the outbreak of that area. So this uh, DSI-2 is a very important, very key, very like good system. That's for collecting the data, yeah. Ah, these are the, the, the list of the, um, the surveillance disease that we are uh, allow, uh, next slide, please. Oh, okay, uh, yeah, this one. Yeah, these are, I'm talking about the, um, the training approach, yeah. Before we are using the DS, DSI2 already, and we have uh, conducted so many training uh, happened in uh, that time, and uh, including the TOT, PSO, and DSO training, yes, uh, occurring, and, and the uh, central provincial repressor training as well. Because uh, this, this is uh, due to why we have the repressor training. It's because maybe uh, most of the country is maybe aware of that. He has to have upgraded from the uh, old version to the new version. So we, we will, uh, so that's why we have really live, live deficient training. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Nick. Yeah. Next one. <laughs> okay. Yeah, and this is uh, the collaborative uh, process. Yeah. Uh, this one we have the, uh, we cannot stand alone for the, this uh, new system. So we have supported from many partners like, uh, um, um, like a DPC, Department of Corporation and Planning, and maybe WHO, we work together closely uh, with uh, implementing. And, and this, uh, this picture, you, you will see that we have another database to monitoring the, the data quality or maybe even the uh, TOT first training, yes, or, or at any activity that we have uh, captured in there and we have to follow up. And then uh, for any activity, surveillance activity, we have the, um, the, the donor to support, uh, such as the, like a view and get a production and it will, Indonesia, uh, Pacific, and also Australian Department. Yeah, all of this activity, the run in Laos, we have support from this uh, donor. Yeah, uh, next slide. Uh, this, these are uh, the data, for, data to action. Yeah, uh, before we are talking about the, the, the system, and then uh, we have to talking about the the data to action. Uh, again, for the disease surveillance, uh, since uh, 2018, we have been using the DSI2 as a, as a uh, original uh, system. And in April, at, I, as I just mentioned, uh, in April 2020, the, the government in Laos have announced that uh, DSI2 have uh, uh, as used, used the DSI2 as, as a main system already. So. Uh, for for detection for the, uh, disease detection, so we have using the dashboard to follow up. So it, it means every day, uh, the province or the health facility worker when they deploy the data, they will use the dashboard to look up the, the, the disease outbreak every day. As you can see, the uh, number of the dengue uh, last week we have like a two hundred thirty two, and then the health facility we have the then we have to look at the low level. So uh, these are the specific one. Uh, the low level, they will see the list of the proving that they are, that's, those data are outbreak. So they will see that is uh, this dashboard will alert the health worker or maybe the, uh, the proving that they have reported in the data. So they will check this uh, data in the dashboard to take uh, to investigation and uh, to disease response. Yeah, and also we also have the uh, the map to track the data. Uh, as you can see, it's very important as well. Uh, many people, uh, many workers in Laos, they are been using the uh, the map in tracking the disease outbreak. Yeah, uh, next slide, please. Uh, 
Now, uh, it is uh, another dashboard. That's we use this. We have developed this for the um, for the outbreak monitoring. Uh, this the the screen you will see the latest one is we alert us if uh, some some health facility that exceeds the the, the outbreak is then the dashboard is will alert and then we will use the, those data to monitor and and for further investigation. Yeah. Uh, this is a really very really good function. I I think uh, many country of uh, many country here are already you been using the uh, email notification from the uh, DHS two to the email, and also it allows we already tested and already used our product this our uh, this outbreak. It will send to the user or recipient will receive the, the outbreak directly from the DHS two to the uh. Email inbox, and you you will see the uh, the the first picture. We can detect that our what which the disease that exists in the in this health facility, and then for the further investigation, uh, the the user have to look at the data in the to uh ESI two as well, and then this this is the 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 kinds of the uh, email email notification is uh in in table. Uh, it we will summarize the, the data from the big dark uh, uh, alert. So, next slide, please. Uh, for this one, I from Lao, we would like to share some experiences that we will uh, that we we have been using. Uh, maybe this. It is just some some place that uh, may, maybe many countries here uh, maybe are facing the same issue. This uh, this is just some something that we would like to say. Maybe because it allow, allows, uh, as I mentioned, uh, the health worker or health worker they have the uh, limited in terms of that uh, technology. So uh, when we go to the fields, many 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 problems that we are uh, detect in the field, like uh, um, we have the um, uh, discrepancy between the data when we start uh, seeking the data from the logbook, it's a logbook. And also because uh, in the DHSI2, we don't have like a, a, a data quality seeking app. So uh, we still using the uh, the Excel to compare the data to, to detect the duplicate of the data. Yes. And also, yeah, many, Many things that uh, we we are fighting in Laos when we are doing the uh, supervision side visit, yes. and, and, and you know there's a lack of the uh, uh, nodular monitoring being conducted uh, by PSO or many things. Yes. I these are just some some issues that I would like to share. From there. Uh, next. And just lastly, I would like to talk about the challenge. Um, actually, um, many countries here, you are facing the, the uh, same issue with the, the Laos. Uh, one is uh, regarding the DHSI2 the system. Yeah, it's a 20 hour run analytic. Yes, uh, we can just, we, we can determine, we can set up the run analytic, but but sometimes the analytic uh, the DHSI2 line analytic field is will affect to the data entry person. Because for example, for the surveillance, we are monitoring in single minute in every day. If you see if the system is failed in the uh, line analytic for that a uh, single minute, it will affect to the uh, the health worker staff as well. Let's see if when they are doing data entry uh, this time and the system is failed, and there's a data to display in the dashboard and they don't know what happened then. You see, it's very, uh, I know this uh, for the developer is maybe cost uh, a little easy, but for the user is very you know, problem for them. So these are still challenge, challenge for the, uh, maybe not only the surveillance program, but maybe another program as well, but especially for the surveillance is very useful. 
And the next challenge is uh, the DHI2 upgrading. Yeah, for the old version, uh, why I, what I mentioned uh, earlier, what we have, why we have to, to have the refresher, refresher training is because of the uh, DHI2 uh, upgrading. Because it's, uh, it's upgrade to the data entry app, right? It allow people, they just recognize that uh, this data entry app, they used to, to use it. And they just, they remember just only one. But uh, before the own, uh, the, for example, the own, the own version of the uh, DSI tool, the event data and TF is slightly di di different from the iCapture, right? Uh, and then people, they are very confused. And then we have to uh, organize the refresher training again for, for whole the country. So uh, it's uh, will cost the, in terms of the budgeting as well, because in Laos, we don't have many donors to support. So uh, let's see if in the future, it happens again. So if there's no donor to support, so that's training will not happen. And the health worker, they will have, like uh, they have, they will start on uh, in terms of the using the DSI tool. So these are the, the point that I would like to say the challenge is very important. Yeah, and then the next one is regarding to the user. Yeah, in Laos we have like, um, uh, because DHI2 is the news, new database for the uh, for surveillance in Laos, and many people they have like uh, uh, limited in terms of their technology, this one. So every changing, just a little bit, so it will change the behavior of the user as well. And then we will get a lot of the feedback. Yes, uh, we know we get a, a good feedback, but and we also uh, get the bad feedback as well. Yes, uh, these are uh, yeah the the challenge that I would like to share for today. Next slide, uh, and the lastly, these are the next step for the Sublime Ilao. Uh, at the moment, we are like a refragments of the dust plot and start uh, standard report because actually we, we are have a uh, be developing the uh, the standard report, but it's not complete yet. So we have to continue to uh, together with the partner to improve the um, wiki report, which is we will use uh, the Solan epidemiology they will use for uh, wiki report. So it's it's not complete yet. And the second one is uh, yeah improve the outbreak alert uh, that I, I just uh, so the last minute for the email notification because in the email notification is uh, doesn't support for loud like this. And it's only also, it only supports for the uh, table table of the disease, but it's not support on in terms of the, the SAR or map. It, it doesn't support yet. Yeah. And, to, uh, and next is our ongoing improve yeah, the data quality for like a for a timeliness, completeness, and accuracy. Yeah, is uh, in surveillance in Laos, we don't have that yet, so we have to continue to develop for that. And, and the last one is the integrating or the routine surveillance, uh, we call event based surveillance. Yeah, this uh, the event based surveillance is uh, also one, one module that we are developing into the DHSI2 for detect the, uh, the outbreak that um, we can have because at the moment the EBS program, yes, we, we already developed in the DHSI2, but it's not completed yet, but we have to continue to, to de develop. Yeah, that's all. So thank you for listening. Okay. Bye -bye. Any question? Thank you. So we've got one question from Arm. Uh, online. Uh, good afternoon, thank you very much for the presentation. How is the current use of surveillance data and, and district and our facilities? Oh. 
Uh, yeah, at the moment, uh, we are using the, um, the data to, uh, to uh, detection the, uh, the disease outbreak uh, together with the, 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 uh, the low level. But I'm not sure that's uh, my answer corresponding to your question or not, because we have a uh, formula team. Maybe you can uh, answer that question. Can they help? No, nobody can help me. <laughs> Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Ban, for the patient and support. Uh, so, uh, I think we need to uh, be taking the best part of the patient. So, uh, basically, uh, apart from the dashboard that you have shown, that's on top of the control level, that they also, also have the same report as. Uh, for each province and uh, district, so for all the eighteen provinces, they will take that for for each level. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Yes, uh, you're right, yeah. Um, because uh, the dashboard that we have developing is uh, is depends on the user. The user, they will use the data, but it's at uh, the same templates, but different level, right? For the uh, PSO, they will see the data and they will use the data, but just at uh, the same templates, like a weekly report, they will use the same data, but just different unit. yes. Questions? No, no. So thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so we're just going to shift gears real quick. Um, so uh, I know there was some other presentation schedules that I guess that they were able to confirm, um, unfortunately, the presentation. Um, so I'm actually going to uh, start off with another session. Ellen will be able to end. I get the I'll do it for you. I'll share my yeah. presentation right now from here. Yes, you will all do that. Yeah. Yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. So um, I have a session where we try to wrap up a little bit. I think we've had a lot of uh, super interesting presentations over the last three days. And thank you to all for presenting your country stories. Um, I'll try to. See if this works. <laughs> yeah. There's a little bit of delay, but it should. Not just a little bit. <laughs> Let's see. What do you see on yours? There we are. Okay. 
we have uh, we have time. Uh, I'll do a relatively quick presentation, and then I hope for some interaction with you guys uh, to get some of your feedback and thoughts. So I'll. Um, while we have talked a lot about different kind of program areas, HIV, TB, surveillance, um, immunization, I'll try to come back to some of the core topics around integrated HIS and some perspectives on that. And then I'll, uh, some of you were in the parallel session yesterday where uh, Sora and Shuradji presented on the maturity assessment and some of the plans around there to support integration. I'll repeat that a little bit and then talk about how we can work together with partners, investors, donors to, to fund, uh, to get more funding for HMIS and integrated DHI systems. And then talk a little bit about how we can kind of build on some of the recent investments, innovations from COVID, potentially into more routine HIS uh, work. And then I just have a summary slide with a lot of links to resources from our global implementation team that can help your implementations. It goes all the way to Norway and back yeah, here before it shows. Yeah. So I think what we have seen in a lot of the presentations uh, this week and also the trend that we see from other countries, other regions, is that uh, we see more and more kind of DHIS systems, DHIS instances popping up in countries. It's not no longer just one HMIS, but there are many, many different program, disease program specific instances. Um, separate tracker instances and then you have um, things like surveys facility assessments immunization campaigns and program specific data repositories data warehouses all these are implemented in dhis in in many countries and often in different databases and sometimes also supported by different teams within the ministry which can also be a challenge and I just want to remind uh, ourselves a lot of ISPs in the room, and I'm sure that especially you from HMIS also agree on this, that it's really a core objective to support integrated health information systems and to build core capacity and enable data use across health programs, integrated data analysis, and not this fragmentation. So of course, we, we are partly to blame on some of these trends because we worked a lot with WHO programs to develop all these modules or packages or toolkits, we, they have many names, for each programmatic area, for aggregate and for tracker. And you see a lot of them. Ah, oh, shit, okay, let's see. What? <laughs> Hold on a little bit. So we've seen toolkits for disease surveillance, toolkits for immunization. In immunization, there are many toolkits within. And then um, HIV, TB, malaria. So if you see here on aggregate, you have all these programs listed with different kind of modules or toolkits and metadata packages. On tracker, we have the same and even more and many more than what's on this screen. And it's all designed to fit within, if you see the dotted line, it's all designed so that it can form part of one integrated system, one DHIS database. That's kind of the purpose of the design behind it. But sometimes these programmatic toolkits can lead to fragmentation because it's tempting to take just the HIV tracker, put it separate, and then the HIV, uh, no, the TB program, maybe want their own separate and they implement the toolkit. And then you end up with multiple databases that if you don't pay attention, don't talk to each other, right? It's a lot of work then to be able to make sure they link, that they share the same facilities with the same identifiers, that the tracker data matches the aggregate data, and that data is being shared. And I think we see a lot of challenges in many countries uh, with this. Yes, oh, it's faster now. Thanks. <laughs> So I think one, one reminder is that it's important to plan uh, holistically and towards this goal of one integrated uh, system that can support data analysis across all programs in the ministry. Um, and of course, there may be good reasons for having more than just one instance. It could be two, three. Sometimes you have very uh, sensitive data, for example, in your HIV tracker where you really want to control access but then at least make sure that you can 
uh, produce aggregate data that can then be shared with the HMIC instance. Um, and sometimes you have very kind of uh, load sensitive or performance sensitive uh, tracker systems like we saw during COVID, for example, the vaccination uh, registry like uh, Pamud was explaining in Sri Lanka covering the whole population. Sometimes those that will need a very, very powerful server and you don't want, maybe you don't want to mix that with the monthly routine reporting and data analysis. So it makes sense maybe to have that separate. But again, get to some, make sure that you plan upfront so that these systems are linked, share the same metadata on organites, uh, on indicators, and that you can share data between them on a routine basis. Uh, not, and it's not just the data that's fragmented, often it's also the people and the technical capacity. So that, you know, we worked over many, many years supporting ministries to build strong uh, technical teams, core, core DHS2 teams within the government. And this is a very challenging task. And if you have a separate team in HIV, a separate team in malaria, a separate team in IDSR, and a separate team in HMIS, you have four times the challenge, right? So it makes sense to try to integrate that as well so that we can work. You can have one very strong team, whether it's in the HMIS, HIS, or IT division, that can potentially support all the health programs with that kind of expertise. And it's a little bit of a kind of dynamic between the HMIS or HIS and then the programs, right? Because to succeed with an integrated HIS, you need to get all the programs on board and they need to trust the data before they're ready to do that. At the same time, all these programs, as we see in this kind of diagram, depends on the same kind of foundational aspects, the same kind of core team, the same metadata, the same kind of capacity to train end users. They all share this kind of same foundational aspects, uh, and it makes sense to try to pull them and then have kind of programmatic data on top, leveraging on kind of common foundations. So we have developed over the last year, uh, together with Global Fund and Gavi and, and his groups, the University of Oslo developed a new uh, assessment tool for DHIS called the Maturity uh, Tool. And this whole, and we tried to really highlight this idea of um, one integrated system building on foundational aspects. Uh, I don't know if the point, you can't really see it, but the foundational aspects are here and I hope you can read it, kind of talking about leadership, governance, strategy, security and compliance, strong core team, good metadata, capacity to, uh, and logistics around training of end users, facility data, and the infrastructure, both the server and also at the end user level uh, across the country. And then kind of on top of the foundations, you have all the aggregate components, the core HMIS, but you can also have uh, special aggregate data for different programs like HIV, TB, malaria, immunization, all the things we talked about this week, kind of building on top of that foundation. And then you go to the next level, even higher up in the, in the house, you have the tracker data, the patient data across the same programs. And the logic is that it's the same as a house. You're building a tall building, and then kind of up in the penthouse, you have the tracker instances uh, that are more complicated to run. And then you have aggregate, and then you have the foundation. And you can think of this maybe as a, the HIV tracker instance, but if it's standing on a foundation like this, it's likely to fail, right? It will fall over. So you need strong foundation, strong foundation, strong kind of ground floor before you can build the floors on top. And that's really the kind of logic behind the maturity assessment tool. And we often see then very concrete linkages that it's very difficult to succeed, especially with tracker implementation, if you don't have strong infrastructure, strong capacity, strong focus on data security, et cetera. And overall having good governance, good strategies to scale, I think affects kind of all this level, both aggregate and tracker. So with this assessment uh, tool, we also help, uh, we want to provide guidance and help to the ministries to plan how they can strengthen, uh, you know, the DHIS implementations. So the tool itself kind of promotes the integrated approach, as I mentioned. Um, Gavi and Global Fund right now are funding his groups to do these assessments in more than 40 countries. And the tool is open, it's available. So you can also, of course, do it on your own initiative and also invite his groups if you need uh, some help with that. 
And as part of doing the assessment together with the ministry, um, his groups will also try to bring in uh, future priorities, roadmaps. We've seen a lot of them this week. Uh, you have your way forward slides. How, does the, uh, how do these kind of way forward and the, your goals match uh, your current state, especially at the foundational level? And the idea is that the HISPs will analyze the, these results of the assessment, look at your capacity at foundational aggregate level, and discuss with the ministry uh, what are your plans, and then provide some key inputs to your kind of DHI strengthening plan. And the goal is that this can feed into kind of one holistic plan. Uh, where you can bring all the priorities across the ministry into one plan and then work with the donors that are funding implementations also so that they can align around one plan instead of kind of providing uh, separate funding for HIV systems, separate funding for data systems in TB, etc. Better to fund one system and, and also pool resources, especially for the foundational level. So, as I said, the HISP groups will work uh, with, the, with the ministries to do the assessment. And then on the left, you kind of have the results of the assessment where each of these components, both foundational aggregate tracker, will be highlighted with a score and kind of maturity level varying from not yet achieved to early progress, adequate and mature. The colors are not great here, but they're supposed to be kind of from red to yellow to green. And then the, the HISP groups will uh, do an analysis and provide some recommendations how to strengthen the foundational level. They will also, as I said, collect priorities from the ministry and try to discuss them, uh, critically assess this and say, is it realistic to do the HIV tracker when the core foundation is, is very weak? Or, or what are the steps to get towards that goal and try to provide some inputs to your plan that maybe you need to focus on strengthening infrastructure, data security, some core team trainings before you can move to kind of tracker level implementation, for example. And I think all this could be very uh, important input and recommended activities into a DHIS country strengthening plan. And as I said, the idea is to try to uh, get, I think both across the ministry, different departments, but also of course the one investing, whether it's the government itself or in, uh, partners like Gavi, Global Fund, World Bank, uh, aware of this plan. And we are working with them from kind of global level. We've developed a tool together with Global Fund and Gavi. We also had discussions with UNICEF, with World Bank. So they are aware that this process exists and they are familiar with the tool. And they expect to see kind of plans coming out of this uh, at country level. Um, and then I think the idea is that if you can have this one plan, how can we then convince donors to put money into this plan and not into all these fragmented initiatives? Um, and we have some uh, funding for HISP TA to strengthen your systems, um, both through the, um, the Global Fund Regional TA mechanism that sort of uh, explained that the HISP Asia Hub as funding for supporting DHIs in countries in Asia. That's a little bit limited. There are some kind of key TA that can be offered there that can address maybe the most critical issues, but I think to really uh, go further and especially to, to fund kind of operational costs like industry training, infrastructure, et cetera, you need to access the country grants from Global Fund and Gavi. Um, and as they are very much aware of this, I think it's a potential now for the next kind of planning cycle, especially with Global Fund, that the HMIS and the HISPs can help to influence this so that it, it's uh, more funding for HMIS, more funding for DHIS coming through those grants. And as I mentioned, we're talking also to other partners like World Bank, WHO, UNICEF, um, and others that are very positive and they, they like to see this approach where they can kind of pool resources and more effective investments. And I think all in all that can maybe change the, the dynamic a little bit from very programmatic parallel investments into more centralized kind of HMIS, HIS focused investments. So I think it's a, it's a good uh, time now to, to focus on this. And I think many of you have already been contacted by the HISPs and maybe by Global Fund to conduct these assessments. And then we look forward to a good process there. Yeah, so 
changing gears a little bit. I mentioned in the intro that we can talk a little bit about kind of how to go beyond COVID. I think we've seen a lot of, um, you know, both rapid investments and also rapid invest uh, innovations during the COVID pandemic. There's been a lot of emergency uh, funding from partners like Gavi and Global Fund and others that have helped the HISP network to work with you over the last two years to, to set quickly set up both surveillance and kind of vaccination systems. Um, how can we then build on this to, to le leverage this and strengthen the HMIs and the routine system? So we've seen a lot of infrastructure scale-ups, um, new service being bought, more equipment being bought, and then you have all these innovations around learning how to do large scale trackers like the immunization registries, more lab integration has been taking place, a lot of innovations around certificates, both for tests and vaccinations, and more focus on real time monitoring and use of data. Uh, and there's definitely kind of an opportunity to build on this increased interest in data and data systems, I think across ministry, but I think also beyond across the government. Uh, there's been a lot of interest increased interest in health data uh, in governments all over the world and i think let's build on that to to get more focus on the routine systems as well and there's a lot of kind of similarities and we're working with gavi both on surveillance and vaccination and we see that a lot of the innovations and work that has gone into covid surveillance can now um, be used to improve routine surveillance like we just talked about and then same with the covid vaccination on the DHI side, these are very similar to the child immunization registries. Uh, and we see, I think we saw a few examples like from the Maldives where they're implementing the, the DHI's module for the, the child immunization registries. And I think that is a potential now that you have a lot of experience and infrastructure for COVID vaccination, that this can also be leveraged in the EPI program for child vaccination. And the same, I think, with the data use and the monitoring, a lot of new dashboards, public dashboards that can now be leveraged for routine data for HMIS as well. Yeah. So the last slide is just to, and you will get these slides, it's available in the, in the Google Drive shortly, uh, give you some links to, to some of the global kind of resources we have to guide your implementation. So, we talked a lot about the WHO toolkits uh, this week. I, I shared some link here to the website where you can kind of summarize everything, but you also have more dedicated documentation uh, where you can read about um, what is available in these toolkits, how to use them, how to implement, etc. And we also have a live demo where you can go in and play with the toolkits itself and, and kind of what it looks like in the HIS. And then more generally to guide implementations, we have a DHS implementation guide with a lot of kind of different chapters on different aspects. I, I just highlighted here a few kind of relatively new chapters in that guide around server hosting and also a security starter kit that can help guide your security officers to strengthen your uh, security and compliance on the implementations. And then I've talked about the maturity tool today. There's a, a spreadsheet version that you can download here and have a look at kind of exactly the questions and how that scoring works. Um, we also have a uh, more dedicated guide on planning implementations and budgeting implementations. And I also wanted to mention that we are planning a new academic course next year uh, that you're all welcome to join that will focus more on this kind of implementation aspects and budgeting aspects of routine health information systems and DHS2 implementations. And finally, uh, I think Shuraji mentioned a few times that the DHI is coming into practice. There's a link there as well. So that's um, it. And then I hope we have some time to, to also get your experiences on this. I think especially it would be interesting. Oh, let's stay away from that. Uh, interesting to hear your kind of experiences from you know, supporting integration, integrated systems, uh, especially working as an HMIS, but we also have a lot of programs here and I think it'd be good to hear their perspective as well on how to kind of work together on one integrated system. And then also maybe some comments on this idea of having one, maybe that's a dream, but this idea of moving towards more alignment in investments and planning, prioritization, and then this one holistic DHIS plan. So I want to invite uh, Dr. Chancellor first from Lao. I think Lao is a very good example 
in terms of uh, building integrated information systems. So great to hear your experience. Let's wait a little bit. Yeah, I think we should go. Thank you. So thank you for presenting that I'd like to share some of the experience of now. What we have when we are running we have to be successfully trying to integrate uh, all the program in one different tool system, one domain. So I think the first is uh uh as we said that we have to really need to strong uh political support, meaning we should have a leadership. Let us mean here we have uh, first we have uh, we need to get uh, this platform to become a national platform for the whole country. So otherwise uh, the program will not follow. And probably in this uh, leadership we should have uh, allowed maybe the different context, but allowed we have also the for health sector reform. And that bit, uh, there are one pillar of health sector reform we are talking about. Strengthening the health services is allowed. So we have already gained support. And we also have uh, for, for our department, we also developed into the health services system, health services system strategy. Five years, and then we can have bigger space on that. So this is the first thing I think that uh, how we can make it together. Second, second thing, because of the need to very strong advocate, advocacy. Uh, probably we will start one program which I already been allowed to implement the uh, mother, mother and child program. So we reduce that uh, because they all have really, really well paper based system. We just customize the system and load it out to the whole country, not just island, just the whole country immediately. And then we do that successfully, uh, FCS, and then we Organize uh, a meeting workshop to solve it, to show all the all the head of the department. So the other program we can see, we you can see that uh, one program is also critical, and other program is really similar. I, we know that uh, by that time in our country we are very fragmented uh, program. TV also has their own uh, program. The healthcare agency also has their own software, very complicated. So now. And then after we solve this process uh, only in one program so that they can think about it and then and then and then second year we just uh, also moving to another program we starting from malaria is more easy for water so malaria has been really successfully implemented and then, we, then next year moving to TV and then SAA so we can try to move it so we take a point of talking advocacy and also uh, because of, uh, we also this program needs to be also in line with the government policy, meaning that uh, the government are tracking this uh, indicator. So we put in that uh, in this as so that we can all uh, providing the you know, real time data or information to the leader so they will get the trust from the leader. So second thing that make uh, thing that I think Korea's and we have to very strong coordination. Korea's meaning that not only the second part of finance and payment from Korea's because they allow us to have a, a global fund, Gavi, World Bank, so they can they can join join uh, uh, funding together. And because of we are joining the funding together, also in our in our. Uh, this health unit or other health services unit. Two people funded from World Bank, two people, other people from funding by Global Fund, sorry, other than one uh, funded by, by uh, uh, Chai or, 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 or ADB, it, it, it is one, one uh, unit so that you can work together to, for program. Yes, this is uh, another, uh, we have to do really strong uh, commission and, and also the uh, uh, partnership to support because. Uh, uh, because, because of the, this part, we are, we, are, we are working together and build a very strong because associate has mentioned the core team. This core team meaning that we have uh, uh, also the expert team. We also have the uh, uh, 
also providing you've got the uh, uh, different funding support so different partners for different parts of the of the uh, system we need uh, some partners support the uh, 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 construction staff some some partners support the infrastructure like uh, providing the internet to the whole country so that and, and this people can enter the other part of providing uh, on, on, on the um, server, so they can set up the server, other part of uh, providing uh, the, uh, creating some, 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 maybe one province, probably uh, different districts, five districts, depending upon the other parties, other six companies, but the same, the same platform, the same thing that there are others. So this is my experience from now. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chansley. I think it sounds like you have uh, succeeded with all these ideas already. I think other countries have a lot to learn from now. Other comments or questions? I guess we all want to get out of here and on the beach. But, uh, <laughs> Lars has a comment there. Uh, More uh, comments and questions. Uh, I'm sure everyone uh, remembers this one. Okay. Let us get ready to talk a little bit about how to actually do some of this. Uh, in, in the latest version, we have this really beautiful um, aggregate data exchange, which is really meant to help you in this uh, process of moving data between these systems. Um, and if you remember back to the, the slide we talked about, um, using like analytics queries in the source instance and moving data to the Target instance, you can use that feature to essentially move data from, from tracking data using program indicators or program data elements and move it over to the edge device. And that's, that might require to set up what we call program indicators in the source, which you can then map to aggregate data elements in the target. And that way, move data, for instance, from, from tracking data to routine, monthly, quarterly data, um, or, of course, uh, aggregate data to aggregate data as well. So, we also trying to help you in this process from the software side. So we just recommend that you change that. Uh, Thanks, Lars. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Take this one. Yeah. Uh, actually, uh, based on our experiences, uh, in my country, W two is that day. we don't say that for Donna. He is a health secretary. So he always support to us as a secretary of the MSP. That's the one part. So WSO should, should take lead from especially the developer franchises for, for, for us, it is relevant. And another thing, my concern is sometimes donors should think about to integrate the higher science, especially for the global part. If the global part starts to collect the data. From the TV center, from the SIV center, that's what it, it happened. If the, uh, if the donor, donor take the data from the national SIS SMI center, then all the programs uh, should come to SMIS and just, uh, the, the, just carry the data. That is very important. I think so. One thing, and another thing is, uh, program is done always every, every uh, month, first week. Program gives them concerned data from the person and SMIS person sit together and validate data. They have the individual data, we have the aggregate data. Just validate. Mm -hmm. Then gradually that type of practice practicing start the harmonization. Mm -hmm. I think so. But main thing is program gives them, I'm not blaming, them, blaming to anyone, but I, I it seems seems like that. Program gives them especially sometimes manipulated data. Maybe because they have to, or they have to uh, uh, receive the more money from the donors. So that's why they should collect the data for the the data, 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 not for the program plans. I think that is part. And other part is legally in my country. Legally, only the SMIs is the authorized, uh, authorized health, in, the authorized health information center. Who provide the data for the ministry, national planning commission, even though the, all the council is coming. But those are far from us. That is the main point. <laughs> Thank you.
No, I agree. I think quick. Yeah, let's take a question, but just I can comment there. I think we are, we are working uh, very closely with the WHO. They have this uh, in the headquarters, this DDI uh, division focusing on HIS, and I know they have some content. There are many countries that have a HIS uh, focal point, and we are trying to work with them at regional and country level to raise more awareness. And I totally agree. I think they can play a very important role in aligning uh, and providing this kind of guidance. Over to Jordan. Thank you. Uh, my question is, there is a stupid question, but I have to ask. <laughs> when you talk about the case-based surveillance structure, does it include the laboratory? Because you mentioned there is a laboratory trial for ASA. So if I want to start in Jordan to implement the HIS, can I start with the laboratory without the case-based surveillance, like the identical part, just to start with the lab and then build on this? Uh, yeah, I think the expert on that is there, but I think just in terms of my slides, I think maybe that was on the COVID uh, slide, was it? The lab I mentioned that the case based surveillance, yeah. Um, in the second slide, yeah. Lab, uh, not a project, but something about the lab. Okay. So I'm confused yeah. that the yeah, case yeah, based yeah. surveillance the lab yeah. or the lab is. Yeah. I'll let Shiraji talk about the surveillance in a second, but I think in, in terms of the maturity uh, module, I don't think we have a dedicated kind of component for the lab, but I think what we are seeing is that many of the tracker-based programs, TB and case surveillance, are now integrating kind of a lab stage and lab data in there. But of course, it's what we saw during COVID is that they, they are able to connect automatically some of the, the lab information systems directly to the DHIS tracker so that you have this kind of automated integration. I think that that helps the, the timeliness of the data. Uh, yeah. But should I just, maybe you can talk a little bit about how the lab and we, we had this session now on the surveillance package. Yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll There's only one online. Oh, yeah. yeah, sorry. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, so yeah, so um, in terms of integration with lab systems and starting up with lab information, so as Ola mentioned, there's kind of two components to this, right? So one is this direct integration with another lab information system and getting that data directly inside of DHIS2. And, and that's, you know, quite mature. And, um, you know, in practice, it, it does take quite a bit of effort and resources to do. And um, within our broader surveillance toolkits and uh, frameworks, you know, we also just have kind of general lab information. So both for COVID or for any uh, for COVID surveillance or any other types of surveillance for each of the diseases we survey, we have basic items on lab requests and lab results um, where you can, and, and lab tracking, sample specimen tracking. So you can take each of these components and just kind of enter baseline information. It's not meant to kind of replace all of the components of a laboratory information system by any means, but it is meant so you are able to track each sample that you're collecting um, for the disease that you're surveying and finalize the results and confirm the case. And that's really what that's meant for. So it's, it is meant as kind of a broader part of the overall disease surveillance kind of package. Um, but uh, it is uh, in practice a bit simpler to implement if you're not linking to the lab system directly at first, let's say, and you want things like the results, you want the type of test that they performed, you want to, to make sure that you're able to track each specimen that's being sent to the lab for, for testing. So it's just meant as kind of a basic precursor um, for that lab information and not as a replacement, but as a next step, perhaps, you know, when you're a bit more mature and, and, and as part of that maturity assessment, when some of those infrastructural um, issues are kind of dealt with, then it might be time to integrate directly with the lab system to be able to bring that data in directly instead of someone having to enter it again, perhaps um, from another source. Does that clarify? Okay, great. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so actually we had just one quick question online for Dr. Chan Salih. So they were asking how you work with partners in the ministry and get them all to work together. Yes, <laughs> because it, uh, maybe because of our department, this world of our department is a planning and, and, and international cooperation. That's why all the planning, all the support from partner, they are, need to be gone to our department. So we, that's why we can, we can guard, we have the authority to 
to gather all the partners to, uh, to work together uh, before they can uh, work, uh, before they can uh, work with the respective uh, program or the department. So maybe this is the one thing. There's, as I already mentioned that because of the, uh, the nature of the system, meaning the DSSU, this is, this is because of the beauty of DSSU, it's not only the uh, uh, collect information, but also uh, collection, store inform uh, information, also analysis and dispersion in one, in one, in one software. It's not, uh, we don't need to add a software to, to but e even though other software also can integrate too. So this is, I think, the main thing we, we can buy in the, the partner to, to use the system. Thank you. Uh, hi, I know. Thanks, thanks, Sula. So, okay, to go to the next session, which is tea break. <laughs> so, that is a one question. So, if he, because like, I know like you people are tired, you also want to go, go out. So uh, what I was thinking, because next is just a feedback and few quiz, which is nice and easy. And we can just like continue and then do the tea break and, and go home. Is that okay? Sure. So then like we can just quickly wrap up the, the whole session and then we have more time to swim. Yeah. Okay. okay then I'll come up. So now is let's just see how many people are sleeping because it's a quiz. Um, okay, everyone. So this was the first time we've had this type of conference in this region. Um, so we just wanted to get a, a little bit of quick feedback from you all um, before we proceed. And then as John mentioned, we have a short little quiz as well, um, just to make sure you're all paying attention. So please, if you can go to uh, menti.com and enter the code up at the top and our online participants, please feel free to also join us in this exercise. And we'd also like to hear from you. So the code is 87343282. I'll just leave this up for a moment. Okay, you can use your phone or your computer. Please don't use both at the same time. Yeah, so just a little couple questions for feedback and then we'll have a short quiz as well. Just give everyone a second to join. Everyone able to join? Anyone having any problems? No? Okay, let's get started. Okay, first question. The conference met my expectations. And we have a couple options for you to select. And please be honest. It's our first time, so we wanna make sure. Okay, some mixed responses, it's fair enough. We appreciate your honesty. We'll definitely look into how we can improve. Uh, 
Okay. The facilitators were able to assist me in answering my additional questions. So if you had questions outside of the conference materials, um, anything on your own implementation. Ah. <laughs> For the person who answered blue, we'll have to um, try to help you better next time. Oh, two. <laughs> And, and please, if there are specific areas that we weren't able to support you with, I, I encourage you to contact us. If you're here or if you're online, please just uh, send us an email. Um, you, I've sent many emails during the last couple of weeks. Please just reply and we'll try to help you better. Okay. I was satisfied with the time and pace of the conference. So I'm running from nine till five and with the breaks, three days. I guess we'll have to figure out for the last little bit if it was the sessions were too long or there wasn't enough time. Okay, next question. I achieved my goals in attending this conference. Okay, okay, so we can still, there's still quite a bit of room for improvement, I can see. I would recommend this conference to my colleagues and peers. Okay, so room for improvement, but we can all see potential. But we have some people who would not, which is okay. So here's an opportunity to provide some more specific feedback. So this is an open-ended question. So I feel the following improvements would improve my conference experience. Okay, and please, I'll give everyone a bit of time um, to, Put in a reply here. More time for swimming. Yeah, so, so on the technical side, uh, I can understand uh, maybe there's more we can do there. Um, it's not a typical academy format where we have a lot of hands-on sessions. <laughs> yeah, quite a few, quite a few, quite a bit of feedback on more hands-on, more technical sessions. Less time in flight layovers. Hmm. I don't know if we can help you there so much. Yeah, technical team. More practical exercises. Contacts for participants. Oh. That's still something we can see if we can share. I think we have to make sure everyone's okay with sharing their details. Inclusion of non DHIS2 community members. Shorter time. Oh, the, someone wasn't too happy with the location. More donors and development partners. So there's still feedback coming in, so I'm just going to leave this open for a little bit.
a uh, quicker response in your registration. Yeah. Food and the coffee, yeah. Okay, this is this is very good feedback. Thank you all for for helping us here. Okay, and this is also open-ended. And uh, I think that's also the last question for our feedback. In which Asian country would you like to see the next Vespasia Hub conference? So some of you had some hesitancy about the location and flights, so. Is everyone just gonna select their home country? <laughs> Thailand? Responses are still coming in. Oh, Malaysia, interesting. Middle East, that's a big place. <laughs> oh, wow, someone's very excited about Vietnam. Mars, <laughs> very interesting. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much for the feedback. Okay, so thank you very much, everyone, for your feedback. I know that there was some challenges, uh, you know, with all the logistics and coming here. And, um, but um, we will try to improve upon um, this next year, and we take all your feedback very seriously. So we'll make sure to review this, and we'll, we will also share that uh, with you um, when we have uh, some more responses to this. Okay. Um, so now we'd actually like to just have a little quiz. Okay. Um, so you'll have to enter your name uh, for this one. It doesn't have to be a recognizable name as long as you remember it. I'll just give everyone a second to register their details. So now you'll have to enter a name, I believe. So uh, for just while you're doing that, I'll just explain the rules a bit. Okay, so for each question, you'll have uh, 15 seconds to answer. Okay, they're all multiple choice questions. Okay, and there's a bit of a leaderboard, so friendly competition, yeah. Oh, you have to press it? Yeah. Nice. So yeah, if you're behind, you might have to press an additional button. Apologies. Okay, so looks like we have quite a few participants. Okay, so you have 15 seconds to answer each question. And if you, the quicker you answer, the more points you receive. So it's both about speed and being correct. So we'll start with the first question. Yeah? So, which HISP Asia group uh, was the champion of the 2022 HISP Asia Cup? No, no, it'll do it at the end. Okay. Good try, everyone. Yeah, it was Vietnam this year. Yeah, first time. <laughs> yeah, 
So whoever's uh, Pat OS, they are the current leader. Okay, next question. As it relates to DHIS2, what does HISP stand for? Ah, very good. I often get this one wrong myself. <laughs> okay, leader hasn't changed, but it's a close race. Next question. What is a DHIS2 toolkit? <laughs> this one's a tough one, yeah? So what we're trying to promote is the use of standards plus configuration, right? So you're also writing implementation documentation, design documentation, training, and, and capacity building materials that are all combined with along with the configuration, all right? So just keep that in mind when you're looking at this. That's a tough one, I know. <laughs> Maybe a bit of a trick question. Oh, we might have a new leader now. A magical rhino in the lead. Okay, next question. Which country is not using DHIS2? Ah, oh, very good. Oh, Lao is, is they just all presented. <laughs> it's all right, it's all right. Still magical rhino. Okay, next question. Yeah? How many his groups are there worldwide currently? So there's 17 groups that are were listed. Uh, you can have a look at the material to see the different groups for worldwide in both in Africa, Latin America, as well as Asia. Let's see how we're doing. Okay, very, very close race at the top. Next question. What does DHIS stand for? Uh, 
Good. Close. Okay. Oceana takes the lead. Okay, next question. Which of the following are apps used for analysis in DHIS2? And you can select more than one response. Oh, okay, we'll just select one that is correct. Must have messed up. Yeah. Okay. So the data entry apps, uh, you can't really use to analyze data so much. Oh, it's very close now. Okay, second last question. In which city was the first HISP Asia Hub conference conducted? Okay, okay, let's see how we're doing. Close up the top. Okay, Oceana's holding on. Okay, last question. Hey, everyone, ready? What are the DHIS2 building blocks? Okay, good, good. Okay, let's see the winner. Okay, Magical Rhino. Oh, okay. Who is, uh, okay, o Oceana. No, oh, no, the next one's Ola. No, watermelon. Oh, is it? Watermelon. oh watermelon. Who is watermelon? Who's watermelon? Oh, come on. Come on, okay. Oceana. Oceana. Ah, good. Okay, so hmm? we have a small gift for Oceana. No, <laughs> So good. Now let's a uh, few more slides and then like we are done, then we can go. Just want to give a bit more like the closing and then also the what is the next step. Yeah, the next one. So basically like for his special hub, there are six groups which we have mentioned. His Vietnam, Sri Lanka, India, 
This presentation is also there in the, the conference folder, so you can actually have. So if you want to contact anyone, you can always, like all the, the email addresses are there, so you can write to them. The next one. His Bangladesh, his Indonesia, and his Pakistan, all the details are is also here. So if you want to contact a specific group of the people, like you can always do that. But if you want to, like you say, like I don't really know which country where in Asia belongs to or who's going to support it, then the next one. You can always just write his Asia Hub at uh, hispindia.org. If you write to this one, we all will receive the email. Doesn't matter whether it is his India, we will go to his Vietnam, his Asia, sorry, his Bangladesh, Indonesia, Pakistan, and all. So if you have any question, okay, like I want to start DHRs to in this particular country, or I am work, I'm in this particular country, can you please help us in setting up this one? So you can just write to his Asia hub at hispindia.org. Okay, so we can all can help and support you on that. So this is just about upcoming academies and calendar. So we are actually thinking of having the tracker configuration. This is hands-on. Eh? It's an actual academy. It's not about conference. So in academy, it's just like people come around, we sit down, and like we go through the, all the conf uh, configuration and also help on your, uh, your own configuration and if you have any questions. The other one is designed for data use. So as we know, like Yon and, and everyone talk about how much it's not only about collecting the data and just making reports and charts, but also how best we can try to use for local action and planning. So that academy will be in the third quarter of next year. And then that was one of the questions, like where will be the next Hispatia Hub conference? So we are planning to have in the fourth quarter of next year, some of the countries which you have uh, listed out, maybe Maldives or Indonesia or Mars, Mars will be good. <laughs> we have all the, the mask and everything. Perfect, next one. Uh, this also is like, if you want to reach out for the, the, some of the materials, like the community of practices, we have the impact stories. So we've been, we've been very good in doing the work, but we, we are very bad in advocating. So even in your place, like when you have things, please write to us, like if we have these particular stories and all things, we can actually put that one in the, the impact stories app. We also have DHS the newsletter, please go around there and you can subscribe. And like, if you want to share experience of DHS to uh, things in your own country, you can also contact that we want to have a small write up or things on our implementation story, which we think it would be useful for other people to learn and see, you can just like all do that. Is that okay? Any questions? <laughs> and then thank you. See you again. And this was the badminton or tournament, his special cup, the winners and the man of the, the tournament. Okay. Thanks. Thanks all. Thank you. And also, please, for your grant, he's been sitting in the back. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. And thank you everyone um, to our online participants. Um, we'll be closing the conference now. Um, if there are any questions about anything, um, you know how to contact us, um, so please do so. Um, but uh, thank you very much for attending. Um, please let us know how the online facilities worked for you, if you had troubles connecting, um, if there was issues with the sound quality, I know in some cases the video as well. Um, we'll look at fixing that uh, a bit more in the, the next sessions. Um, thank you very much for attending and uh, we look forward to having you attend in person and virtually next time. Thank you.